on it. And, and then we'll ask them some lovely questions they can speak on and we'll go from there. Um, so I want to say that Career Week consists of a series of panels with industry professionals that covers topics such as career paths, how to get a job upon graduation, career advancement, uh, gives Mount students an opportunity to learn from industry professionals themselves. My name is Kayla and I'll be your moderator for today's tourism panel. I would like to start to say uh, thank you to our extraordinary panelists. Uh, we have Kat Moven, uh, Krista Lingley, uh, Carrie Power, Carl Catino, and Emily Haynes. Uh, so I'll start by giving a brief introduction about Carl, um, who is a native Haligonian who grew up in our very own Clayton Park. Uh, Carl made the decision after high school to stay home and complete his Bachelor's of Commerce with a major in Finance at St. Mary's University. He began his 20-year career with TD Bank in various roles, including management, business development, and commercial banking. Carl and his family purchased Avondale, Avondale Sky Winery and restaurant in Newport Landing, Nova Scotia, continuing to build a career at home. Next, we have Emily. Emily has been an executive director of Taste Nova Scotia, a province-wide marketing association with over 200 industry members since 2016. In her role, Emily leads a multi-phase program of industry awareness, member development, consumer marketing events, and the provinces by local program. Emily is active on several committees focused on economic growth, export development, and culinary tourism. Then we have Carrie, who is the Director of Operations for Hotel Halifax and the Barrington Hotel. Her career started in university where she was introduced to the hospitality industry at Dalhousie. She, held, uh, she has held positions as front office manager, uh, executive housekeeper, room, rooms division manager, director of operations, and now dual director of operations. She is also proudly serving on an executive leadership team and contributes to the hotel's ongoing success. Then we have Krista. Although her background has been in advertising, marketing, and sales after graduating from Dalhousie with a BCom degree, uh, she fell in love with the tourism industry and the tourism marketing around that. She left the industry years ago and was introduced um, in the industry working for uh, Atlantic Canada, Pan Atlantic destination marketing association that marketed with Atlantic Canada um, to international markets. And lastly, we have Kat, who prior to graduation accepted an offer from Delta Hotels as their leadership development program chosen candidate. Uh, having studied and worked the operational side of the hotel industry for seven years, she was eager to learn the insides and outsides of the corporate sector. Um, she had accepted an offer uh, from an internationally renowned Canadian group of boutique luxury hotels, spas, and restaurants known as Experience Old Montreal. Uh, working closely with all the members on their sales team, she was fortunate to gain insight into revenue and yield management and the tough, stubborn skill of solicitation. Um, so I'm going to move forward uh, to let our panelists themselves give a brief introduction uh, to themselves, something they can add on to what I said. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Emily, if you don't mind taking that away, please introduce yourself to us. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks so much for inviting me to be here today. Um, uh, my name is Emily Haynes. As already mentioned, I'm the executive director of Taste of Nova Scotia. I've actually been with Taste of Nova Scotia for 11 years now. So this month is my 11 year anniversary. So prior to being executive director, I was the manager of membership services. And I am born and raised in Nova Scotia. My mom comes from a family of Annapolis Valley farmers. We had a family farm that was dated back to the late 1800s. And my first summer job was picking beans for my grampy on his farm when I was eight years old. Uh, and I also worked uh, in the restaurant industry for a number of years. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for uh, the work that goes into putting food on our table and that goes into our uh, tourism, hospitality, and service industry. And it's an honor to be part of an organization that 
uh, promotes those businesses and pr promotes Nova Scotia's uh, culinary industry. Uh, so it feels very fitting that I that I ended up where I am from where I began as a as a little kid. Awesome. Thank you for adding that. Emily. I'm going to swing over to Carl here. Um, tell us about yourself a bit, the job you work for um, and your company. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, as, as you mentioned, uh, my family owns Avondale Sky Winery in Newport Landing as of uh, the end of November 2019. Uh, my role with, uh, within the organization, it sounds a lot cooler than it really is, but it's the uh, president and operations manager of, of the business. So uh, for me, I kind of oversee uh, everything uh, one way or the other, but I do have, uh, you know, a vineyard manager, a winemaker, uh, my, my parents each do different roles within the company. Uh, my mother does like our bookkeeping and our payroll and our, pay, you know, making sure all of our uh, bills get paid. Uh, and uh, she also works in our retail winery shop. Uh, my brother is the VP and the general manager at the winery. So he kind of runs the restaurant side of our business, as well as just the retail uh, aspect, you know, what we're having on the shelves, uh, the staffing, all that fun stuff. Um, my father, uh, he's a green thumb by nature and, uh, both, I should have added my, both my parents were retired prior to getting into this. So, um, it was sort of like a hobby, but it's probably more work than they signed up for. Uh, so my father works in our, uh, vineyard as well. Like he works with our vineyard crew, uh, working for our vineyard manager effectively, even though he's an owner. Uh, and he also does all the landscaping on the property and sort of does property management for us. Uh, and then my wife, Jamie, who's also one of the owners, uh, she, she does all of our social media uh, and interactions and stuff like that. So uh, my role specifically is to kind of let them all do what they do best. And then I work with our vineyard manager and our winemaker uh, on, on really more so, you know, what grapes are we growing? What wine can we make? What wine is in demand? And then I kind of work with our, obviously our end customers like the Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation, Bishop Cellar, Harvest Wines, uh, and then all the many restaurants, uh, you know, even though they've all had a tough year in the past year, uh, that's part of my role is to kind of get our wine to market uh, and as well, uh, delivering to customers as well. So um, that's uh, in a nutshell, uh, it's a lot, but it's a lot to oversee, but it's a lot of fun too. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of fun, but I can see it's a great family uh, team you have there. Um, so I'm going to move on to Krista next. Uh, would you be able to give just a little intro of yourself? Tell us about your position and the company you work for. Sure. Uh, so, um, yes, I had been involved in tourism marketing um, after I had uh, left university and being in uh, some advertising agencies and um, really fell in love with the tourism industry. Uh, started to work with uh, the Atlantic Canada Tourism Partnership, which was the Pan-Atlantic partnership that uh, marketed the region to international markets. Uh, and so the I was the overseas program manager responsible for several markets, the UK, German speaking countries and Japan, to really learn how to work closely with our travel trade partners, as well as travel media and as well our consumer program. So that was um, that was for 10 years and I really enjoyed that. And then I really felt perhaps another angle would be to work on the, the uh, attraction side. And that's what led me to my current position, which is with Parks Canada. And like Emily, I'm actually um, celebrating my 11th year in this position this month uh, as well. So been here for 11 years as a promotions officer uh, with the mainland Nova Scotia field unit. Uh, Parks Canada is um, divided up by field units right across the country. There are actually seven field units within Atlantic Canada here. I'm part of the mainland Nova Scotia. Uh, Cape Breton is a separate field unit. And so my responsibility is to promote the Parks Canada places within Nova Scotia, mainland Nova Scotia. So that would include the Halifax Citadel, George's Island, uh, Kejimakuchik, Fort Anne, Port Royal, uh, and then some smaller um, sites as well. So I work closely with tourism partners um, uh, that would include Tourism Nova Scotia, Discover Halifax, Taste of Nova Scotia as well. Uh, so Shore Tourism, uh, Destination Canada, and I have many colleagues um, that also contribute towards um, obviously bringing uh, more visitors into Parks Canada places, but also growing that awareness of what we do. 
it is a federal government agency and there are over 5,000 people that work for Parks Canada, but from a field unit perspective, we tend to be uh, to work very closely uh, from an operational point of view. Um, some of the types of things that I would be involved with could be from uh, frontline right through to photo shoots, uh, film shoots, uh, developing consumer marketing um, and uh, the distribution of all of that. So it can vary from day to day. That's a little bit of a snapshot. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, gives us some insight towards that. Uh, so I'm going to move on to Carrie. Would you be able to tell us a bit about yourself, the position you're in and who you work for? Certainly. First off, good morning, everybody. And thank you to all the students who tuned in today. Uh, looking forward to spending the hour with everybody. Yeah, so my name is Carrie Power. I'm the Director of Operations for Hotel Halifax and the Barrington Hotel, formerly known as the Delta Hotels. Maybe some of you may know them as Delta Hotels. Um, those two hotels are now managed by Silver Birch Hotels and Resorts, which is a Canadian company, um, which has a portfolio of over 19 hotels within Canada. Um, so my role, I, um, as mentioned, I'm on the joint um, leadership team for the two hotels and, and oversee operations. Um, so that includes uh, the associates at, at Hotel Halifax and the associates at Barrington Hotel. And although our executive team is a joint committee, um, we do run the hotels as two very separate uh, entities. Um, Hotel Halifax is sort of known for our meetings and conventions and being sort of that large heartbeat of the hotel of, uh, of Halifax. And the Barrington Hotel is a boutique hotel, more intimate, three levels, um, and again, has its own niche within Halifax as well. So that, that's an overview of my position. Again, excited to be here today. Awesome, thank you, Kay. Um, and Kat, are you uh, able to give us a little introduction to yourself? She maybe stepped away at the moment. Okay, we can come back to her. Um, so I'll move on to our second question. Um, what we would like to know uh, is, how important do you think speaking multiple- Kyla, can I introduce myself? I'm sorry. Oh yeah, 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 that's okay, yeah. I was gonna swing back to you, but we can go to you now. So take no, it away. No, no, I'm sorry. I was uh, sending an email. Um, I'm very sorry. I did listen to everybody's, intro everybody's intro information. Thank you very much for inviting me again. It was a pleasure to be on the Learners and Leaders Conference last week. It's a pleasure to meet um, all the alumni and thank you again for inviting me. I am currently a director of sales and a board member and investor of Pure Entertainment Group, Inc. We are a global bespoke luxury travel and lifestyle management company catering to uh, high net worth, ultra high net worth, um, be it celebrities, political figures, or your run of the mill investment banker, someone who's very specific and uh, works very hard. Think of it as a, a high-end travel agency, but we also do conciergerie, um, not a hotel conciergerie, but let's say um, you're in Copenhagen and you need a, a booking um, at a restaurant, or you happen to someone from Milan finds himself in Halifax and really wants to explore Cape Breton. Um, that's what we specialize in. Um, I come from a background, I'm, I'm Persian, so hospitality kind of is in my blood. Um, I did do an undergrad in law and French law, at the um, in a, in a university in the UK, and I was a transfer student to um, the Mount. Um, that's where I made some of my best friends. Uh, the hosp I, I'm, I still um, technically live in Canada. I'm in, I'm in the US right now, um, but my permanent residence is still Canada. And I have to say, having lived in Montreal, Nova Scotia, no one beats. Um, there are no warmer people than Nova Scotians. Um, and I'm very proud to uh, always give back to the university and the institution where a lot of my dreams came true. Thank you for that. It's amazing. Um, so I'm going to move on to our second question uh, of today's panel. Um, so we would like to know if uh, you see it as important um, for someone coming into your career speaking multiple languages. Um, what languages uh, help people uh, keep jobs, um, 
what languages help people uh, pursue their career um, in these tourism jobs uh, that benefit them the most that you would say? Um, I'm gonna just get everyone to give their brief input here. So I'll start with uh, Kat Ashley, uh, if you can just give your input. Um, in the 90s, um, I'm a little bit older than the students here, I guess. Um, in the 90s and the early 2000s, um, a lot of the reading that I did said that IT and languages is something that you should always um, invest in because those are things that could never really go wrong. Um, languages definitely help in the tourism industry. Um, even if you're a traveler yourself, if you, let's say, go to Montreal and you speak French, um, that helps. Right. So if you're going to apply for a job um, at Delta Hotels, which is where I did my leadership training, or you want to um, be, uh, an, you know, enjoy be a management trainee for the Fairmont Hotels, which move you around the world on your resume, it definitely helps. Now, languages on the side help your brain grow. They give you better memory. Um, they help your listening skills. They make you verbally and non-verbally more intelligent. They help your cognitive, um, like they actually help you cognitively decline less. They make you creative. They make you multitasking. And most of all, it looks good on your resume. I would say be very specific about whether you're proficient or fluent. Um, you don't want to enter uh, a job and say that you're fluent and then they find out that you're proficient. There's nothing wrong with saying that you're proficient in a language and fluent in one, but it definitely helps. And whether you're going to be a tour guide with Parks Canada or you're going to work for Tourism Nova Scotia or Tourism Montreal, Tourism Toronto, languages are definitely um, a plus to have. But if that's not your thing, then show your other skills. Thank you, Kat. And I'd love to just hear your guys' opinion on that. Um, Emily, could you say uh, how important do you think languages are uh, to a career in tourism? Um, maybe what language specifically? Well, I guess that really depends on where you want to work. You know, Canada is a bilingual country, so certainly having French and English is, uh, is a great asset. Um, however, there are many languages that can be an asset. I think it really depends on how you um, leverage it as an asset if you do have multiple languages. I, I feel really grateful that my parents put me in French immersion when I was you know, two Anglophone parents uh, who can't speak a word of French. Uh, took a chance and put my sister and, and I in French immersion and that was in the early days of you know, the beginning of French immersion being available in Nova Scotia. And it's definitely been a benefit to me in my life. Uh, I've chosen to put my uh, my daughters in French immersion as well. Um, so if you have multiple languages, um, leverage those. If you don't, uh, it's never too late to uh, learn and, um, and work away at it, but I don't, you know, I think um, I think tourism definitely is one of those industries that attracts people with really diverse backgrounds, and um, you see people with a number of languages uh, and diverse in a diversity of languages. And I think there's a huge asset to that. And I think businesses see that as an asset when they're looking at building their teams and looking at having the ability to cater to a variety of clients um, because we are we're looking to attract people from all over the world and not everybody's going to be able to speak english fluently or proficiently or french so having a team with a diversified skill set and languages is definitely a huge asset yeah for sure thank you for adding that in um and carrie would you be able to add anything to that I, I would agree. I mean, within the hotel industry, we are welcoming um, individuals from all over the world. Now, um, a front desk agent, for example, if they can speak multiple languages, it's certainly always very helpful. It is something we look for when we are, especially in both French and English, when we are recruiting. It is something we do look for and we do consider it an asset. Um, that being said, it's not just front of house. We are looking to all of our associates within the hotel to really come forward, let us know the language that they speak and help us, whether it's with um, cheat sheet or information to be able to share with us some common greetings so that we can specialize and customize our welcome to our guests. So it is an asset. Service is what 
uh, sets us apart at Hotel Halifax and the Barrington Hotel from, from what we believe other hotels in the city. And so absolutely, we are looking to diversify that team and see what can be added to help us contribute to welcoming our guests. Language would 100% fit that mold. Thank you. Um, and Carl, do you have anything to contribute to that there? I, uh, I honestly think the ladies did a fabulous job answering that. And I think they're in probably more of, uh, they see more tourists that probably speak multiple languages, both uh, as guests and as staff than we would see. Uh, you know, we're out in uh, about 40 minutes out of the city. This past summer, there wasn't a lot of tourism at all. Uh, so I would lean towards French and English, obviously, that that would probably be um, the short answer because, uh, you know, we are in rural Nova Scotia and uh, we would love anybody that can speak, you know, Spanish or Mandarin or anything like that because you just don't know what what tourists you're going to have. But honestly, I don't think we would make or break a hire on it um, simply because you just don't know who who might be walking through your doors. So French would be would probably be the prominent one, I would say. Um, but and I like like Emily was saying about her her girls. Um, I, I've got my kids in French immersion, and it's amazing. Um, you know, even at, at age four, when you're signing them up for school, you have to kind of make that decision. If you don't sign them up for French immersion, you can't until grade seven. And it's like, well, what's the risk? There are still, there are sponges, they're learning. So it's like, put them in and you can always pull them out and switch them to English. And, you know, I've got uh, twin boys that are in grade one and it's amazing how they can, they can read better in, in, in French than they can in English and they're reading in, in French and can convert to language. So I do think it's, uh, you know, if you have the opportunity uh, to, to learn another language uh, or multiple languages, you should take it because it is, as Kat mentioned, it's still a good thing to have on your resume. You become more of an asset because you never know what another company might be looking for. Thank you. Yeah, it definitely seems like a tool on our tool belt that we could use to our advantage. And Krista, did you have anything else that you could add to this? Uh, well, certainly from a federal government perspective, being bilingual, having English and French language ability is definitely an asset to work with Parks Canada and any other federal government uh, department. Uh, Nova Scotia is actually not classified as a bilingual region within the federal government. So English is, or sorry, being bilingual is not necessarily always required. Um, but so there are a number of English essential, that's what they would call them, uh, positions available. So don't be alarmed that you have to be bilingual because if you're not, there are still opportunities um, in certainly in our area, but uh, Western Canada and Northern Canada as well. Um, my current position is English and I, but I work with a lot of colleagues that are bilingual. Uh, in Quebec, there are a number of French essential positions, so French only. Um, but they still need to, we still need to provide all of our programs in both languages, all of our marketing materials must be in both languages. So it does help to have a working knowledge of both languages. Um, and then certainly as a, as part of the Government of Canada and as we work towards reconciliation with Indigenous partners, um, speaking Mi'kmaq and other Indigenous languages can actually be beneficial. Um, and so we'll start to see more of that as we continue to work towards that. Uh, so again, again, like everyone else has said, it, if it's an opportunity for you to leverage that in your own personal uh, CV, please, you know, do take advantage of that because uh, people are looking for it. Thank you, Krista. Um, yeah, we hear often with government jobs that having a second language um, could only just help you get that advantage up um, compared to the next person. So it's great to hear your perspective on that. Um, so I'm going to move to my third question, and it's actually going to be for Emily. Um, in uh, April 2019, you went to Ottawa and spoke to the Standing Senate Committee of Agri on Agriculture and Forestry to discuss the importance of supporting local food producers, processors, and entrepreneurs. How did you prepare to speak to members of our federal government, and what was the experience like? Um, it was, um, it was really intimidating. I'm not going to lie. Uh, when they invited me to come speak to the Senate Standing Committee on Agriculture, I, I, I think I asked, are you sure? Um, <laughs> cause it was, I was still, I felt, still felt fairly, uh, you know, new in my role as executive director though. Um, you know, I was two and a half years in and, 
Um, but it was an honor to be asked. Uh, the preparation, I spent a great deal of time actually preparing. Uh, I, I reached out to uh, provincial uh, colleagues to get statistics um, that I didn't have ready access to on uh, the agricultural industry in Nova Scotia in terms of the number of farms and the economic impact of the industry from both uh, the local standpoint as well as the, e the export standpoint to look at uh, key industries um, and key products for our industry. Uh, I really wanted to be able to speak to it beyond what I know as the Executive Director of Taste of Nova Scotia and the 200 plus members that we work with. I wanted to be able to speak to it on a deeper level as well. Um, and uh, I sort to prepare, I, I, I did a lot of research, I prepared uh, a presentation, I actually prepared a PowerPoint and I printed off PDFs for all the senators to provide them with while I spoke so they could uh, have the information with them. I also brought uh, agricultural food products for them. So I brought them all uh, a Taste of Nova Scotia gift basket, so to speak. So I brought them uh, no Van Dyke's wild blueberry juice and dried apples from Noggins Farm and honey from Cornect Family Farm and made with local granola bars and um, other items like that. Because I also wanted to show them the actual products. I wanted to put put these products in their hands and show them what is actually coming out of Nova Scotia and the um, product, but it's, it's all the entrepreneurial um, businesses that it inspires. So the food production and how that impacts our restaurant industry and our culinary tourism industry and how we tell our story in Nova Scotia through food and drink and how this is a huge part of our attraction as a culinary tourism destination, the story that we have to tell. And I really wanted to impress upon them that this is, um, you know, there, there are very real people behind this, that it's part of the fabric of who we are in Nova Scotia. And it has a tremendous economic impact beyond just the fruit that grows on the trees or the product we pull out of the ground, but everything else that it contributes to. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a really, it was a really exciting experience. It was definitely intimidating, uh, but uh, I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to do it and uh, would not hesitate if I were uh, invited back in the future to do it again. Awesome, thank you for adding that. Um, you not only gave them some visuals, you gave them the whole experience. Did they get to try them? They did. Yeah, they cracked them open. They they enjoyed they enjoyed them. I mean, that's what we do. We you know, taste of Nova Scotia. We like to give people an actual taste of Nova Scotia, and uh, you know, we believe that you haven't really seen Nova Scotia till you've tasted Nova Scotia. So I really wanted to bring them. Um, a sampling of what we have to offer here in this province. And and um, some of the senators were from Nova Scotia, so that was wonderful as well. It was senators from across the country, but there were actually three um, three senators on this committee who, uh, who are from Nova Scotia. Some fellow Nova Scotians. Yes. Um, so thank you for that, Emily. Um, that's super interesting. Um, and I'll, I'll add one other thing just in, in the context for students when sometimes we're asked to do things that you never stop feeling intimidated or scared with some of the things that you're asked to do um, from, you know, presenting to what feels like a could be an intimidating group and you sometimes question your, you know, what value do you have to bring to this group, um, but it, it is you have to remember that everyone wants you to succeed and that these fears don't go away as you get older and get more experience. You, st you still have these opportunities that challenge you and take you out of your comfort zone and scare you, but you wanna remember that this is where growth happens. As well, the people inviting you to participate in these opportunities and to present, they're inviting you for a reason. They want to hear from you and they want you to succeed. Thank you, Emily. So I'm going to move on to our next question. It's for you, Carl. Um, Avondale, Avondale, 
Avondale, yes, I'm saying right. Avondale Sky Winery offers a diversified product consisting of a winery, wine club, shop, dining options, and events. What we would like to know what challenges and opportunities does this diversification bring to your business? Um, some complications or obstacles you had to overcome. Yeah, it's a good question. And frankly, it, uh, our business gets even further diversified than that because we also are, we're farmers too. So, you know, we're growing grapes and dealing with pesticide management. Uh, obviously with any business, there's the HR component. Um, one thing I would say that you could look at it as both a challenge and an opportunity is because we're diversified, uh, the challenge is there's a lot to manage. It's a lot to look at, you know, keep your eye on the prize on each, each area. Um, and it's hard to be an expert in each area. And I think I kind of alluded to that at the beginning, at least I have sort of managers overseeing each, each department. Uh, but I've got to know a little bit about everything. I don't need to know everything about everything. Um, but so that's a challenge, uh, but it's also an opportunity because as we just saw in the past year with the pandemic, you know, uh, you have different silos in your business too. So if one isn't churning, and I'll give you an example, there was our restaurant, of course, which was a bit delayed in opening. Uh, there was the amount of people you could have on site, uh, which, which obviously affected many businesses, um, but other restaurants, right? Restaurants in the city or, or the valley that would typically, um, you know, look for a lot of tourism and a lot, of, lot more people in, the, in, the, in their seats. That means they might be buying more wine from us and all of a sudden that dried up a little bit. So from a diversification standpoint, we kind of moved to a model of, well, we still have product. We still have to sell this. And then we use kind of an online channel and delivery um so there yeah and like events there wasn't many there was a few small weddings but again a lot of people had to postpone their weddings this year couldn't have staff parties couldn't have christmas parties so you know uh, that'll come back around that might be another year might be another two years um so it, it's important to be diversified in that regard that I, that I would look at that as an opportunity if you have a strategy for each one whether it's what's the winery's plan if there's a lot of tourism how are we going to staff you know uh, you also have the diversification as we mentioned on the vineyard. Like we had a great summer last year. It was the best summer we've had in Nova Scotia in my memory, uh, certainly in the last 20 years. Uh, and it just happened to be really good for growing crops and grapes as well as probably apples and other things. But uh, for grapes, it was great because uh, it, you got enough rain, not too much of it. And, and so from that side of it, it helps our business. But mother nature is, is what it is. We could have a terrible winter or a long winter. Um, then all of a sudden this year, crop might not be as good. So, uh, and that, that, then that affects your business on how much wine you can make. And then that changes your business model of how much you can sell, of course. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I would almost say the challenge and the opportunity are one and the same. Uh, it's good to be in different areas because if you, if we were, I always said this many times in the past year, if we were only a restaurant, I would, I would be scared. Um, as I'm sure many other restaurant owners would feel having it as part of our business. It's a drive to get people out to the winery hear the story, hopefully have a great experience, tell their friends, leave with some product, maybe come back again. Um, but if it was our only uh, revenue stream, we would be, uh, yeah, we wouldn't be in a, a very good place. Yeah, thank you for adding that, Carl. It seems like a lot of factors um, were into play there, um, especially new obstacles you didn't think you would have to overachieve, I mean, overcome. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to move on to our next question, and Kat, this one is going towards you. Um, in your job, you provide clients with a once-in-a-lifetime travel package experience. Um, what makes those packages unique? Uh, tell us about the most interesting travel package you have put together. So um, it would be hard to pick one specific package. Um, every day we get um, about 10 requests. We're quite selective about, um, we, we do cap at 100 members per year um, because we are um, specialized and every year we have 100. So we, we work on a membership basis. We have four membership levels, but we have on-demand clients as well. Um, so what I'm trying to say is uh, it's hard to pick one. But speaking of wineries, uh, Carl, we do, for example, uh, privatized vineyard tours, um, one in Italy we did, we brought Bocelli in to sing, we brought a Michelin star chef um, for a client who wanted to have a very specific uh, 70th birthday for um, his father. 
Another one um, in a client of ours um, in UAE, most of our clients, I would say 40% are US and Canada based, but the rest are in um, Zurich, um, Europe, and with politically what's been happening, we have a lot now more influx coming from Asia and the Middle East, because that's kind of where the money's moving. Um, a contact in UAE contacted us, uh, a client, a member contacted us um, for a, a very big surprise for his wife, um, who's a big fan of a celebrity. Um, unfortunately, I can't name her for her for their wedding to have um, you know, a congratulatory message for her wedding, for their wedding. Um, we had a deadline of 10 days that was quite difficult to um, locate this celebrity who um, is on our list and she's helped us before. Um, we, being Arabic, you know, she she had to be covered up a little bit. We caught her just before uh, Paris Fashion Week. She dyed her hair blonde within minutes of us catching her. Um, that's kind of giving away who it was. But she um, wished them a happy birthday um, in Arabic. And um, as a as a goodwill gesture, we also um, did a signed kind of um, congratulatory message from this client. Um, to the couple for bringing us, you know, this business. Another one I would say um, for a 40th birthday, we did, um, a client wanted to do a, a big safari in Africa. So they wanted to do the big five in Africa. Um, we had uh, about four days to plan this. So we did a full package. They were flying from Zurich, Switzerland. Um, we landed them, we have a global address book. So we landed them for an eight day trip. Um, we did an intimate tranquil hideaway in Kruger National Park. For four days, they did a balloon safari experience. Um, they did body work. Uh, then they had a private vehicle twice daily, taking them through the safaris and game drives. We're against hunting, so there was no hunting. Um, being a Canadian company, we're very much against that. Um, but they got to do that. Um, following that, um, we took them to an iconic uh, property in Cape Town for the second part of their trip. Then we had a rugged helicopter um, ride over the majestic Table Mountain where experts showed them like the cultural walking tour and expert guide. Um, they did a painting class with a renowned African painter, wine and wine tasting. And then all this came with, you know, VIP meet and greets um, at the airport where they would just kind of, they came out of the jet, put their head down and just went through. I say all this, I'm on the buyer side. I very much miss the supplier side and working in hotels. Um, I do miss front office, which was kind of my thing. It was just there that um, when I was doing my leadership training with Fairmont and Delta, that's where they told me that, you know, I think your passion is conciergerie. So then I kind of wanted to start my own, but then ended up becoming partners with um, the CEO of the company where I'm director of sales now. So um, on either side, it's fun, you know, because no day is the same in the tourism industry. Uh, whether you're serving a client who walks into the Delta hotels or your winery, it's all about service. It's all about personalized service. So it all kind of comes to the same thing. And that's what you're studying right now. And whether it's facility management or whether it's, you know, you want to go into um, hotel management, a housekeeping planner or a tour guide. So those would be kind of my top three things that we did. Thank you, Kat. Um, wow, you gave us um, some details there. It sounds like they, I hope they had an amazing experience. <laughs> There's always complaints with our clients, don't worry about it. But overall, yeah, they do. <laughs> um, so that's awesome to hear. Um, we're gonna move on to our next question. Um, and this is towards Carrie. Um, we'd like to know, uh, how did you make your way to such a high level position within your organization? Um, maybe some stepping stones or uh, something. Tell us about what got you there. Sure. Well, I, you know, I'd like to speak with the students on this because I want every student that has an interest in joining the hotel industry um, as through that sector of tourism that they're able to attain these positions as well. And I know that from experience and I'm gonna tell you how to do it <laughs> if, um, if this is your passion. Um, but for me, it did start as a part-time job during my studies at Dalhousie. And um, I quickly learned, and Kat mentioned this, that having that genuine, genuine personalized service every single guest, every single time brings a, a sort of joy to those in the industry. And you quickly understand that um, I love doing this. I love making people happy. I love learning from where they came from. And once you get that bug and, and once you understand that this is your passion, from there, 
Um, I'll certainly give you what I think the milestones or the stepping stones are to advance your career, but 100%, that absolutely has to be the basis of why you're joining this industry. Whether it is facility management, whether it is a room attendant, whether it is a front office, or whether you want to join the executive team and learn more around the business side of, of, of running the hotels. That absolutely has to be the foundation because it guides every decision you make, every, every opportunity that you have to give input or say into how you're going to operate. It always comes down to the guests and that passion and that love for service. Um, so for me, anytime there was an opportunity in university to step up, and when I say step up, I would say um, become a trainer, lead a shift. Anytime that opportunity presented itself, um, for me personally, I, I would raise my hand. And um, Emily made a comment earlier in regards to like, even in your early years, and as you move on, sometimes you wonder, what did I just volunteer for? What did I just confidently say that I will do? <laughs> and you have a bit of self-doubt sometimes when you do that, but when you jump in and you know you've always done it, um, you're, you do it and you do well. And I will say that joining a company like Delta and Fairmont and now our two hotels, Hotel Halifax and the Barrington Hotel has a combination of that rich culture. Um, we want people to succeed. And so there is a support group to help you every step of the way when you're stepping up into these different positions. Um, for me personally, what I, I think sort of push the career is when I graduated from Dalhousie and I was ready to move um, really into the health and fitness industry, which in my personal time, I do love to run. I run marathons. I love learning about the human body. Um, it just happened that the tourism industry just caught me. Um, so I still keep my studies in my personal life and all the things I learned in university does help and guide me um, the way I do a presentation, how I prepare for presentations. I mean, certainly everything I learned in university and everything that the students at, at the Mount St. Vincent are using are going to help them move forward um, 100%. But for me, it was relocating. So um, I did have my first um, department, um, if you will. So the front office department here in Halifax before deciding to relocate. There are so many hotels in Canada. And so really just lifting your head, going back to that courage, applying for positions that might be a stepping stone above what you think you're ready or capable for um, and, and going for it. Um, thirdly is taking the opportunity and signing up for every training opportunity possible. So from leadership training, to finance training, to um, union, union relations training. So within hotels, we offer all of that ongoing training, which really just adds to what you've learned throughout your schooling um, and um, keeps you current within the industry. And then beyond that, a mentor. Finding leaders within your organization that you can lean on, talk to, ask for advice to help move your career along would be a way. And I had a mentor. I'm very fortunate to have had a mentor. So yeah, here I am today. I've been in the industry for 23 years. I can't believe it. Literally right out of university. Um, and I still, every day, love coming to work. <laughs> That's great to hear. Thank you, Carrie. Um, it's amazing to see um, people who enjoy what they do so much. Uh, it gives us more confidence when we leave school. Um, so my next question is actually going to be for all of you. Um, we would like to know how social media and technology impacts the success with your organization. Um, if you're able to speak to that a little bit, Krista, I'll move towards you if you can answer that one. Sure. Um, Parks Canada continues to develop new ways to use technology in order to stay relevant with new and existing audiences. Um, our web pages, we work constantly to renew those, make them more mobile friendly, make them easier to navigate. We are required through the Government of Canada to follow the architecture. So sometimes we maybe feel uh, more limited than a private sector organization. Uh, however, it is a constant uh, uh, piece of technology that we will continuing to work on. 
Uh, we've created some apps that have been very helpful um, in terms of helping our visitors plan their itineraries, find special events, find trails, things like that. Uh, this past summer, uh, as a result of the pandemic, we had our Learn to Camp team um, pivot and create a podcast. This is working with the Friends of Kedji. It's called Thinking Outside, the Learn to Camp podcast. And I uh, invite you, there's a series of seven um, podcasts that uh, can be downloaded, uh, talking about storytelling, um, adventures and interpreters, and what makes camping so important. Um, certainly as Canadians, we understand the background of camping, um, but we have a lot of new users that we wanna bring into our lovely fold, enjoying camping. Um, and, and then in terms of social media, uh, we are using uh, social media to help build trust, build awareness and brand awareness, and also continue with that authentic and genuine voice. Um, and you know, ultimately we wanna create ambassadors of our brand and that they will share it with their followers. And so we do have uh, multiple accounts at the national level, which would include Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. And then we have many uh, platforms, uh, Twitter and Facebook at the site level as well, that tends to be a little bit more specific. Um, obviously user generated content is, is key for Instagram and we've had our Instagram for uh, four years. We're approaching um, about 470,000 visitors or users on that account. So um, it's constantly evolving and will continue to evolve. And I've been really pleased to see our uh, national colleagues really taking that on because it is an extremely valuable platform for us. Thank you. It seems like you're using your avenues to your advantage. I'm sure that helped um, when things were a little more uh, steady there um, earlier on. Um, awesome. So I'm going to move on to Carrie. Would you be able to speak to that, how uh, social media and technology um, helps the success in your organization? Um, so for social media, um, very important to us as an independent brand now. Um, we don't have in our particular organization brand power that would direct people to your home website or the specific apps associated with the brand. So for an independent hotel, like Hotel Halifax and the Barrington Hotel, um, I can share that, you know, it is the most profitable avenue to have someone book their reservation directly at the source. There are commissions, there are fees associated with other platforms. And so social media for us is a way to capture the audience of our um, Maritimes, which is predominantly who travels to our hotels. 70% of our business does come within locally within the Maritimes. Um, is through social media. And so whether it's just contesting or suggesting or sharing or posting special rates, social media becomes very important. And we've actually hired um, students um, and uh, I would say younger, but students and those that either have the training or have the ability um, to really creatively um, utilize uh, social media to, to have that voice within the maritime for us. And then in terms of technology, um, technology is changing our industry fast and furious. Anywhere from, um, you know, checking in from a mobile app, um, contactless check-ins, which happened pre-COVID, um, to keyless entry. So technology is really changing the way hotels do business and it will continue to change. And if we don't change, and if we don't hire students and individuals that can help bring us to that front, we will fall behind. And, and we've got to keep, we've got to catch up. We've got to make sure that we stay there. So technology is extremely important in the hotel industry. Thank you for that, Carrie. Um, yeah, I've always wondered about that, actually, because I noticed when we started seeing um, more just like keyless entries and um, I was very young when that switchover was made, but um, even just like noticing that I was in a hotel that didn't have one, that that was like something I noticed was surprising. Um, so yeah, um, it's funny that you speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for answering that. I'm gonna move over to you, Carl, if you could speak how uh, social media and technology helps the success of your organization. 
Yeah, absolutely. So for uh, for us, as we mentioned, uh, kind of off the top, we are relatively still new owners to the business. One of the, uh, you know, what is it, what, 13 or 15 months ago or so. Um, but one of the big opportunities that we saw was that social media, media really wasn't uh, utilized to the uh, abilities that it could be. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the way you get your brand out there. That's the way you get people sharing, you interact with your customers as well as other businesses. Uh, you know, Taste of Nova Scotia is a great example of, of a partner of ours that we're, you know, we're sharing posts, they're sharing posts. Um, so my, like I said, my wife kind of handles that aspect of our business and there's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of interaction when you, when you make a post uh, with your customers uh, that then gives you the ability to, to try and, you know, entice them to, to buy some pro product or come out and visit you or what have you. Um, but also, you know, it's just to, to have the presence because if you were doing a post once every two weeks or every month, just when there was something going on, you're not even going to be on anybody's feed. So um, social media is definitely the way that uh, a lot of people, a lot of businesses are getting their name and their products and services out there. Um, so it was just, it was clearly an opportunity. We've uh, you know, we've grown our followers probably by nearly 100% um, in, in that short period of time, just because we had a, a focus on it uh, and also trying to get people to like and share and follow uh, because that's how we give a lot of updates on product that we have releasing or events that we have going on. Um, sorry, the other question was social media and just technology or? Yeah, yeah. How does technology help you guys um, uh, be more successful? Yeah, so um, I, I don't, I mean, I guess it's still technology. It's probably not as cool as keyless entry and stuff like that, but, uh, you know, online, like an online platform, our, our business historically, again, prior to us taking ownership was if you were ordering it online, it was simply because you didn't live nearby. We were shipping it to New Brunswick or Ontario or Alberta. Um, and so what we did with the business model and what really, if there was a silver lining to COVID, uh, what it gave us was, People weren't supposed to leave their house and people still wanted to drink wine. God bless them. So, um, you know, <laughs> what we, what we had to do is say, you can still order it online. Like you don't worry about coming to pick it up. We'll bring it to you. So we, you know, we leveraged the technology that we already had built, uh, but really changed it from saying, this isn't just because you can't come to the winery. Now no one can come to the winery. So you might be, you know, five doors down and uh, you still can't leave your house, whether you're quarantining or just, you know, the, you're following the stay the blazes home when that happened. So from March to June, uh, you know, we like we did way more in sales in probably two weeks, really, than the company had done in historically in three years online. So it was really just about leveraging the platform that was already there. And again, just kind of moving with the punches that were coming. Uh, even some of the unforeseen stuff, but now it is now it is a channel for us. It is a revenue channel that, you know, there's deliveries that I'll do later today that people are ordering and it's convenient, right? At the end of the day, that for our business, it's getting your end product to your customers and convenience is key. Um, so that, that I guess would be, uh, you know, I could get into some of the technology on sort of uh, wine tanks and, and, and equipment, but it's probably pretty boring. Uh, but, you know, th th from what an end consumer would, would appreciate it's just simply leveraging online so we have more brands that we can offer than you're going to see at the nslc and stuff meaning avondale sky of course not not all the brands they have um so you know we have five listings at the nslc but there's people that like wines that we don't have at the nslc so rather than say come drive 40 minutes and 40 minutes back to come get your wine we'll bring it to you uh, and that's what the online channels allow us to do yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, um, I think even like looking pre-COVID, um, at least myself, I'm new to the um, legal age, um, but I didn't notice many wineries um, did that to begin with. I'm sure that uh, did the opposite of what they wanted to do because they want people to come to them. But it's interesting how um, it changed things for you um, during COVID. Uh, so it didn't um, not help you. It did help you. Yeah. No, absolutely. And like you said, it's diversification. We want, we still want people to come to us, but if you can't, you got to get it to them. You can't wait. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to go to you, Kat, if you could speak to us about how uh, social media and technology has helped the success of your uh, company there. 
Sure, thank you for the question. Um, I'm gonna go back to what everybody said, especially what Carrie said. Um, to be in this industry, you have to be a people's person. Um, if you're not, there's other opportunities in the industry for you as well. Um, you could be a reservations agent and not so much be face-to-face -face with people. You could work in the accounting department. Um, but communication kind of goes hand in hand with um, social media these days. Um, whether it's fortunate or not, um, people in their youth, you know, when you go to the Westin's website or you go to the Delta's website, um, you go to any hotel's website, there are pictures there. However, um, mo a lot of the young travelers, uh, they will look up the Twitter pages of the, of the, of the hotel, they'll look up the Facebook page, and especially they'll look up the Instagram page because they want to envision themselves there. They want to see that what's important to them. Instagram and social media has become so huge in the past 10 years. So of course it's integral. For us, um, specifically because we cater to ultra high net worth, they're not really looking at social media. So we don't invest that much in Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram. We do have a presence, but our clients aren't, you know, going to see, oh, what will my private jet look like? Or what, what my, but that's where we kind of put a shout out of, you know, to, to show appreciation for our partners or to entice people um, to say, you know, for example, look at this beautiful property um, in, uh, you know, Tuscany that you might go to just to inspire them. They might think they might be, you know, at home working during COVID and they might think maybe I can privatize this place. Um, for us, it's not a huge investment. That said, in my previous jobs, you know, at the Antonopoulos Group with Rosewood, Delta Hotels, the training management, like it is a huge, huge um, investment. Technology wise, I would say we have a blog um, and a newsletter that immediately every month um, and bi weekly goes to our members um, and people on our database. Um, we have, um, we work with, you know, we don't really solicit a lot. Um, people hear about us. Of course, there is a lot of solicitation from um, our my, my sales team, but people read about us in the press. They come to us. They see what we can do, whether it's a good fit. Um, the newsletters, you know, around Valentine's, there aren't anything that's going on, whether it's Monaco Grand Prix coming up or whether it's uh, the Golden Globes or whether it's, um, you know, a marathon or whether it's a winery in Nova Scotia that's doing a big thing or whether um, there's something happening in Cape Breton. So anywhere in the world, there'll be a newsletter there going out to them. And on our website as well, when you log in, there's a 24 hour person who you can speak to. When you log in, someone will be there in a chat saying, how can I help you? Because people these days don't always want to pick up a phone and call your entertainment group. Some of them do, some of them don't. Some of them want to email us, some of them just want to talk to, you know how when you're logging into RBC and they say, do you want to chat? These days, people are a bit less confident to just, they want to do something at the same time as chatting to something. So of course, technology is integral because communication comes into it. Um, and it's, it's, it's very important. Either you keep up with it or you kind of lose in the game. That's something that I've learned through tourism conferences that we've been going to, um, that you got to keep up with the game or you kind of stay a little bit behind. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, I can see how um, you're helping make uh, people's lives much easier and not more complicated uh, by just aiding them just a little bit that way. It's also we got to make money, right? So <laughs> if you're not if you're not if you're not there for the customer, they're going to look for your competitor. You can be sure of that. That said, if it's not your if it's not the business's um, motto, if it's not what you know you're looking for, then that's fine. You go for different ways. It's what works for you. Um, but, you know, it is a money making business and um, you have to stay on top of the client's needs. You have to know what they want and you have to cater to that. That's just as simple as it is. Thank you, Kat. Um, so I'm going to move on to you, Emily. Um, if you can add to how social media and technology has helped the success of your company, um, maybe you can speak a little bit to that. So social media is a huge part of what we do at Taste of Nova Scotia as a marketing association. Our mandate, our primary mandate is to help grow our members' businesses. So we see social media as a tool that helps us promote our members and tell their stories, um, as well as promoting uh, Nova Scotia, both to locals and visitors. Uh, so we manage 10 social media platforms at Taste of Nova Scotia. Uh, we are content farmers basically here. We are constantly um, looking for content, creating content, uh, whether it's stories, uh, recipes, sharing events, product releases, anything we can. Um, and 
it's been critical for us, uh, especially this past year. Social media has been the primary tool for connecting with people, for connecting with consumers. We've seen our social media reach on Instagram alone grow by about 75% uh, in 10 months. Uh, so people are paying attention. They're looking for information and social media is a key tool for sourcing that information. Um, but really your, your social media platform is really, it's only as strong as the content that you're putting out. So it's critical that you're putting out valuable content and that your content is specific to the platforms. Different platforms have different uh, strategies behind them. So what works for Instagram does not necessarily translate to Facebook, to Twitter, to Pinterest, and so on. Um, so it's really important to understand each platform, uh, who your followers are on that platform, what they're looking for, and building a strategy that is um, unique to each platform. Uh, and we also have a newsletter, which is really uh, important to us as well that we share monthly uh, with our newsletter subscribers. Uh, we also share newsletters with our membership base. So we have over 200 members and communicating with them is really important. And we're always encouraging them to tag us on social media so we can see their content and then share their content as well. Uh, Cause we have a really good uh, follower, a following base and we want to help uh, connect our members with our followers. Um, and then for, you know, it's all about having a variety of channels to reach your consumer base, to reach your audience. So some people are gonna find you through your website. Some people are gonna find you through Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. And some people are still gonna want printed materials. Um, so we still do printed materials at Taste of Nova Scotia that are hugely popular. You know, we print a, an annual culinary guide with uh, listings for all of our members and it's filled with recipes and beautiful imagery. And we have people who send us emails from, and call us every year asking if it's out and wanting us to mail it to them in different parts of the country or different parts of the province. So that is another form of technology. We forget that paper is still technology. Um, and this year we're actually built, uh, we're going to be launching a mobile app in the spring that will be, uh, um, you know, will have the capability for people to plan their culinary adventures to eat, drink and explore their way around Nova Scotia from the palm of their hand. Uh, so we recognize that that is another really important tool. People are using their phones constantly. And if you can give them a toolkit that is right there in what has essentially become part of their body, um, you have another way of, of reaching them and giving them a valuable tool. I also see it as it's really important that you bring value to your audience, right? Your audience wants it to be useful to them. You want to give them valuable information so they keep following you and they keep engaging with you and you want to give them technology that's seamless and works and makes their experience easier. So that's uh, that's what we're trying to do so that we can better service our members and help grow their businesses. Yeah, again, touching up on that convenience factor. Um, for your consumers, which is great. Um, I also like how you mentioned about understanding all different platforms um, for uh, who you're posting for and like um, understanding your audience there. Um, even just like running social media for say my soccer team. Um, I don't like regurgitating the same information on everything. Um, to me, it just gets a bit repetitive. So I like um, that you guys are considering that and everything. Um, okay, so my next question is, we would love to know uh, what advice you would give to a students who want to work for your company. Um, Carrie, if you would be able to take that away. Um, the advice I would give to students is to, um, you know, come to the interview sharing all of those things that, um, that make you um, I guess, show or showcase your love for helping others, um, for, you know, being able to show um, that you have a thorough understanding of, you know, problem resolution and, and understanding that um, 
our customers may not be may not be right, but their feelings are right. And a customer will leave any industry or any hotel remembering how they were made to feel. Um, and not necessarily if an issue was resolved. So we're always looking and listening to the answers when people come for interviews, um, that they're really reflecting on the outcomes when they explain how they would um, solve a problem or how they would make someone stay really special. Um, we're looking to understand how, how you could make that, how you would make them feel. Um, and so sometimes interviews are hard and I think there's great people out there that will bring a lot of value to Hotel Halifax and the Barrington Hotel. Um, but I would, my advice to students is to really practice and ask industry, you know, what are you looking for in an interview? What is it that would set me apart? And sometimes it's just about the act and the skill of showcasing. Um, so that, that would be my advice. Um, if any students ever want to connect with me or, or call me, you're certainly welcome to do that. But um, or also just ask anyone that that is in a hiring position and really refine those interview skills. Thank you, Carrie. Some valuable information you can take away there. Um, so I'm going to keep this going as we're uh, getting into our last seven minutes. Um, Krista, would you be able to tell us what advice you can give to a student who's looking to uh, get a career in your company? Sure. Um, First and foremost, I would encourage anyone interested in working for Parks Canada to apply for student positions. They're a really great opportunity to get operations experience, get that foot in the door, find out what types of experiences are really offered in that area uh, geographically or from uh, in terms of a certain um, interest area. Uh, they generally run May to September, so they fit well with the student schedule, um, and they can be in resource conservation, visitor services, uh, natural history, uh, heritage presentation, or even office support and working in uh, tourism promotions, for instance. So you register with GC Jobs, which is the jobs.gc.ca. Uh, make sure that you have an account. Um, that's where all the Parks Canada jobs and federal government jobs are posted. Uh, for and that are staffed externally, and that's important. Um, and when you apply for the position, give as many details. The form that you fill out um, really will allow for all of that. So make sure that you populate it with all of those skills that you really feel uh, that you could leverage in the position. And I got this tip from one of our human resource uh, contacts that would copy do make a copy of the poster, the job poster, and that's really the job description, so that uh, for all of the ones that you're applying for, so that when you are invited for an interview, you're going to be asked a lot of questions, and you are assessed on those questions, and they, di they directly relate back to that job poster. So it's just a tip, you know, give it, a, print it out. I know we don't print everything, but that's an important one to print. And if you're interested in knowing more, we, our website, um, parkscanada.gc.ca, you can go online and find out there's a join us category at the top of the menu, uh, lots of information. Uh, and we've also got a Nova Scotia webpage for um, some listings that are specific to Nova Scotia. And there's the uh, FESWEP, which is the federal, federal Student Work Experience Program that you can also uh, log into. So there are a lot of great resources. And again, do your research online, find out what is available to you, and spend a time thinking through um, how you want to present your skills and your experience. Thank you for that, Krista. It seems like there's lots of opportunities there. Um, so I'm going to move on to you, Kat. Would you be able to tell us um, what advice you'd give to a student looking to pursue a career with your um, I think Krista and um, uh, Carrie already touched up on a lot of it. First and foremost, I would say get in touch personally with me. Um, in the chat, I've put my the website of our company and the link to the careers. Um, you can contact me. My email address is on um, the, the contacts page, um, Tanisha, um, Steve and I are the three main um, management people in the company. Obviously we have a lot more staff. I would say 
tell me that, you know, this is where you saw me, um, make it personal so I remember you because I see all your names here. Um, so I will remember you. I know that you're watching. Um, say what your strengths are. We're looking for travel connoisseurs and people who are really people's persons. We look for uh, risk takers. Um, be in touch with the news. We will ask what you think about what's going on in the world, um, what's going on in the industry. Um, you should kind of be aware about that kind of stuff, but really tell us what sets you apart from the rest. That's a lot of pressure. You're gonna get some interviews, you're not. I have been rejected from interviews before and there's no problem in failing. I always say, if you fail, fail again until you don't anymore. Um, and just, we look for people who are passionate about travel and want to travel. With us, you will be, um, open to traveling the world quite a lot. I'll be quite honest with you, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, some people are not, some people are not comfortable with living out of a suitcase. They, um, you know, and obviously we're, we're, we're human. Um, we don't just make you travel, you know, 12 months a year. And right now with COVID, something that it's showed us is that everyone can in fact work from home. That, I know that question was um, taken out, but it shows that, you know, we all are versatile and everybody can actually work from home. But you know, COVID will be over by 2025 um, in the tourism conferences that we have. Every airline is making their employees sign that, you know, by 2025, they're not obliged to bring them back. But this will be beaten in the next few years. You don't need to worry about that. I would say get in touch with us. And um, are we going to do the last question um, about, you know, uh, what advice would give or is that out? Like, I, I think that we're wrapping up here. Uh, okay. In that's fine. I was just only going to say that um, you don't always have to get the highest grade in the class. Don't be upset if you get a B. Um, don't walk out of the exam upset. Spend as much time as you can. Make yourself a little corner in your home and study in that little library. I was always that kid who was um, in the little quiet corners, um, but then socialize, network. This is part of the networking network with us. Carrie would love to hear from you. Emily would love to hear from you. Carl would hear, love to hear from you. I think, you know, we see the potential. That's why you're here. So I would just say network, network, network. Thank you for that. That's some great advice there. Um, okay. And Carl, would you be able to tell us uh, your advice for a student coming into a career with your company? Yeah, uh, certainly. So um, obviously, it's a it's a vast. We have lots of students that will um, that like even as young as 16, 17 that might come work in the vineyard as an example. Um, you know, it's a, it's it's hard work, uh, especially in you know hot summer days, thirty degree weather with the humidity. You know, you can bring as much water as you want, but there's a lot of rows of vines to go through. So uh, there's that side of it, the agriculture side that we, we certainly can hire students younger um, because obviously we're serving alcohol. You've got to be at least legal age um, to work in the winery or the retail side. But we uh, we would have opportunities for whether it's serving staff, if you have a passion in some, sometimes at 19 and 20 might be too young to have a passion in wine, others maybe not. Um, but yeah, we have lots of university students that'll come and we are a seasonal business. Like it's not like we are open to the public uh, 12 months a year. So you tend to attract um, students for, you know, four or five months a year, what works with their schedule. So, um, but yeah, if you have a passion in, in the hospitality industry or tourism, um, we would love to see that, you know, in the next year or two tourism pick back up in this province. Um, and it would give you an opportunity to work in the food and beverage side of the business. Uh, but also to learn about the wine because wine is very it's it, you know, obviously you can be a sommelier you can go on and do many many things in just that industry um, but I find working at the winery you, you can dabble you could learn how to make the wine and be an assistant to our winemaker you can work in our uh, vineyard and learn a little bit more about the grapes and and how you prune them and you know, what the whole um, procedure is or you could work sort of as it would be similar to any restaurant except more focused on you know, what pairs, like how is wine actually a food versus a drink um, and that sort of thing. So those would be the sort of uh, at a high level, the the opportunity we would have for students. And, you know, we'd love to have them come back year after year, but the reality is we understand where it's, people are looking for work maybe more of a full-time basis or at least throughout the whole year. Um, we can't bring everybody back every summer because they, they've moved on to other things. So we're always looking for talent. So if you're interested, um, I can certainly share my contact info uh, in the chat if that helps. And if anyone's uh, looking for, or just has any other questions, uh, they can reach out. 
Thank you, Carl. Um, yeah, feel free to do that um, if you like to. So many options there that some people aren't even aware of. So thanks for speaking to that. Um, and Emily, I didn't know you yet, did I? Um, so for students interested in working with Taste of Nova Scotia, we regularly um, hire co-op students. Um, right now we have two students with the uh, PR program working with us and uh, another two that will do their summer term with us. Uh, and that position is very focused on um, PR and communication. So a lot of social media and content development. But we have had um, some tourism specific placements uh, that unfortunately had to be put on hold last year uh, or had to be canceled last year due, due to COVID-19. We have a space at the Halifax Waterfront Visitor Information Center uh, specific to Taste of Nova Scotia where we provide visitor servicing focused on culinary tourism and focused on um, our member experiences. Uh, and we're unsure what's going to happen this year. Um, a lot of things are in limbo because of uh, the pandemic. Um, but what I would recommend is, you know, look, look for those, uh, if there is an opportunity um, and you do get an interview, I'll build on what uh, the other panelists have talked about understand the job description. If you do get to the phase of um, getting offered an interview, whether with us or anyone, you've been offered an interview because they see potential in your resume. They see potential, they see that you're hireable. And so take that as a very serious opportunity that you need to prepare for. So understand that job description, understand the skill set that you can bring to it, and also understand the company. It is so frustrating to an interviewer when the interviewee arrives and is unprepared. It changes, it, it affects the flow of the interview. And it also sends a message to the interviewer that maybe this person really isn't that interested in the position. They haven't done their research. They haven't really understood the job. They haven't, what, what came across in the cover letter and the res resume isn't necessarily translating in the interview. So it's really, really important to do your research. Don't, you know, make sure you understand the job and how you can deliver to it, but also make sure you understand the company and what role that job's going to play in it. And if you can't answer questions that, speak to that, it will, um, it, it will impact how you perform in the interview. And uh, a candidate who can speak to those questions uh, will, have, um, will have an edge over you. So uh, take time, you know, do your, do your homework. Um, it's so important and it speaks volumes to the person interviewing you that you are actually passionate. So I would say if you're passionate in the food and beverage industry, um, don't just look to Taste of Nova Scotia. We have over 200 incredible members all across the province that have opportunities as well. So um, cast your net wide, uh, find the area that you're interested in and apply for uh, as many opportunities and, that you can that, uh, that spark interest in you and, and answer to what you're passionate about in this industry. I couldn't agree with Emily more there. Awesome, thank you. A nice little uh, conclusion there to our panel today. Um, that brings us to the end of our time. And uh, on behalf of Mount St. Vincent University, uh, we would like to thank our panelists today extremely for coming and giving their time, um, their advice, and valuable information. Um, we will be able to take this away and um, use it for further uh, educational experiences or job opportunities just um, having someone speak to this is amazing. So thank you. Um, and yeah, so thank you again for students who were able to attend to our tourism panel um, and finale to our 2021 career week. Um, that brings us to the end of our session and it was nice having you all. Thank you. Thank Break you a leg in those exams, guys, and stay strong. <laughs> Bye Take now. Care. Bye. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.